I am not tied to any specific thing either. I just like that we are able to talk about it. I like the way it is now and that we have the freedom to discuss whatever we desire that comes up and really have like that honest conversation. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 217. We're Finn and Emma, and first things first, Happy New Year! It's 2022! Happy New Year, Emma! Happy New Year! It's exciting, right? We survived 2021! (laughs) We did! (laughs) Yeah, that was quite the year! We are super excited for 2022 and have lots of exciting things coming up, which we'll get to in just a minute. But first, we want to talk about Sarah. Today's interview is with her and... (laughs) just We're just talking about all Sarahs today. (laughs) Just all Sarahs out there. No, this Sarah we talked to has been non-monogamous for about five years and exploring a lot of different dynamics within non-monogamy. And we have a beautiful conversation with her. We talk about how she has felt like monogamous relationships have not really worked out for her and she didn't fit in. And we also have conversations around, I guess, finding balance and security within yourself and in your relationships. It's an awesome conversation. Yeah, we're super, super, super grateful that she reached out to us um, and has been as vulnerable as she was. And uh, we also wanted to point out some of the work that that Sarah does as well. So she's a writer on Medium um, and does a lot of blogging over there. And you can find links to her work in the show notes. Highly recommend it. I was reading some of her articles the other day and they're really great. And she's also putting on something called the Alternative Relationships Summit. So you'll actually hear us talk about this a little bit in the episode. She says, I hosted a summit in January. That's because we didn't know at the time that we were going to be able to get this out in time. So we were pretending it hadn't happened or that it had already happened, <laughs> it already happened. but it hasn't happened. Nope. So it's happening January 13th and 14th. So that will be next weekend mm-hmm. uh, 2022. Yes. And uh, it's about 30 different people speaking about how they do love and relationships outside of the norm. You might even recognize some of the speakers because a whole bunch of them have been on our show, including us. Including us, yes. So we are going to be recording with her in just a day or two for that, and we're super excited, and we're super excited to get that out there. So uh, it is a free summit uh, if you can join on the 13th and 14th. If you miss it on the 13th and 14th, don't worry. Uh, There are ways to download it and uh, access the content after the summit is over, and there are links in the show notes to how you can sign up and how you can access all of that content if you're listening to this perhaps after the summit has already come out. Yes. And we encourage you to use the links in the show notes and on our website to sign up for the summit so it lets Sarah know where you heard about the summit. So go check it out. And before we jump into the interview with Sarah, we just have a couple of quick things that we want to tell everybody about uh, because, you know, community is the name of the game. And we're doing a whole bunch of events uh, this spring that we're excited about. So the first things first, just a huge uh, thank you to the Patreon community. There's almost 200 of you now. And it's amazing. This has been the highlight, honestly, one of the absolute highlights of the last few years for years for us. So thank you all for being a part of the community. If you're looking for other people to support and be supported by uh, within the non-monogamous community, we highly recommend it. It's awesome. We have an ongoing MeWe chat. We do monthly Q&As. We do a men's group. We do a women's group. We do it all. It's a couple bucks a month, and we'd love to have you join us. So thank you in advance for anyone who hasn't joined, and thank you to everybody who's been a part of it. Yes, I'm just going to piggyback off Finn's thank you and uh, just add mine. Thank you so much to everyone who's part of it. And just a quick note, if you're looking for the upcoming uh, dates for our calls each month, they are available on our website, so all the January dates are posted there. Next up, we have a bunch of virtual events coming up. That are not part of the Patreon. These are open to anybody and everybody. Yes, the requirements are are that you must be open-minded and respectful. And awesome. And awesome. <laughs> so the first one is coming up on January 
13th, that's a Friday, and that is going to be a virtual play party. However, it's not that kind of play. It's we have partnered with a strategic play consultant, and we're going to be having so much fun. This is going to be something different than our normal meet and greets, but we're going to be hanging out with, his name is Gary, and links to his website are also in the show notes. Come give it a try. It's going to be something different than your typical, I guess, virtual gathering. And it's just going to be a lot of fun, a chance to get to know and do some fun events with new people. Yeah, I would recommend wearing a diaper in case you laugh so hard you you pissed your pants. Jesus. (laughs) That's what I'd recommend. I mean, you do you. I didn't think you were going to go there, but okay, sure. They never think I'm going there, but I went there this time. Then the next day after the play party, uh, we have one of our regular meet and greets on Saturday, our virtual meet and greets. And we have another one on January 26th. Same thing. We're mixing them up, throwing them different times of the week. So That's going to be January 15th and January 26th. Exactly. So you're going to want to check those out. Those have been growing every month, and we're super excited about those as well. To find out all information about all of these events um, coming up in January, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the Community Events tab. All of the information will be there. Under the virtual events. Yes. While you're there, you'll also see a thing that says, like, in-person events, and you're like, holy shit, there's in-person events too? Yes. There are. Just a quick note on these. We are monitoring COVID. uh, Omicron. Yes. Damn you, Omicron. (laughs) We are monitoring everything with COVID. And so right now we have left our current in-person events on the calendar. However, we are continuing to monitor them. And if we need to cancel, we will make sure everyone gets a refund. However, I just wanted to note that. Yeah, and so we're not we're not planning any other events in February, and we're actually kind of looking ahead to March and April. We're going to be in California. We know we can be outside, and so we're we're kind of that's sort of the tentative plan on that. But yes. there are a couple of events in February. Um, they are sort of indoor outdoor spaces, and they require because they're in New Orleans, uh, they're requiring vaccine cards to get in. Yes, the first one is a meet and greet on February seventh in New Orleans, and then a pool party on February twelfth. We're super excited about these events. As Finn said, vaccinations will be checked at the door. To sign up, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, and click on the Community Events tab. You'll find all of the information there. Also, a quick note on the pool party. It is very limited in capacity to about 40 people, and we have almost 20 signed up. So if you're thinking about doing that, if you're thinking about joining, you're going to want to jump on that uh, because it is going to sell out. Yes. And then also in March, on March 26th, we have a pole dance event that's going to be in San Francisco, California. And if you remember Amy from episode 188, or if you don't remember her, go back and listen to that episode. Um, we're partnering with her and doing that this pole dance event. Again, it's also limited in the number of people. So go sign up if you're interested. We'd love to have you join us. Yep. This is your one and only chance to see Finn pole dance. <laughs> Is it the only chance? And uh, unlike the play party, I will not be wearing a diaper. Oh my God. Right? What's with the diapers today? <laughs> I just thought I would tie it together. Okay. Well. So anyway. On that note, let's go talk to Sarah. <laughs> but before we do, head over to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the com- contact us tab. Send us an email. Send us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, We read them all. We respond to them all. So thank you in advance for doing that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with this extra long intro. We know there's a lot going on, but hopefully you found some value in it. Yes. And let's go talk to Sarah. Well, welcome, Sarah, to the show. We're excited that you're here today and we can't wait to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're pumped. And we know we know a little bit about you. We've been chatting for a few minutes and you send us an awesome voicemail, which reminder, people can send us a voicemail. Right. But anyway, <laughs> um, we'd love for you to introduce yourself and uh, get to know you a little bit better and, and learn about non-monogamy, what non-monogamy looks like for you and, and how you've been tackling that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm. my name's Sarah. I uh, live in Berlin, but I'm from New York. And right now I'm trying to open the conversation up around sexuality um, and make space for people to feel more comfortable having those conversations about sexuality and non-monogamy. And I do that through blogging. I write a lot on Medium and also 
um, teaching online courses and hosting sometimes online summits um, where people talk about this, uh, have these these conversations. So yeah, I want to like reduce shame around sexuality in particular and uh, through having, through through talking about it more. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I guess that leads me to ask kind of what is your relationship dynamic? So I've been exploring non-monogamy for the last five, five years or so. And right now I'm in a relationship, a non-monogamous relationship with uh, my partner. Uh, We live in, we both live in Berlin and uh, we, yeah, we don't have like any specific, we we don't have a label, let's say, but we've been (laughs) uh, since last, since the beginning of the pandemic, essentially dating. I was interested in non-monogamy off the bat. I had some like experiments with it before we met that didn't, didn't end up being like a healthy non-monogamous relationship. And then when he and I got together, I came into the relationship saying, this is what I want is what I want our relationship to look like. And that was, that was pretty new to him. Um, so I didn't know how he would, how it would work because I, the relationship I had before that, I also came in with the same like idea, but then in the end he ended up, it, it, ended up not being a good fit from his end. Like he didn't, he didn't really want it. He wanted to be monogamous. And so because of that and many other reasons, we ended up splitting up. So I kind of expected it to be the same, (laughs) to be honest, but yeah, thankfully, um, he ended up really liking, uh, the, the experience. Like, so we talked at first just about like, all right, we're okay. If the other person meets someone out at a bar or at a club or something or on vacation and then they, you go home with them. So that was like the one thing that we both had agreed on from the beginning. Um, and he was more hesitant for us to either of us to actually have a more intimate emotional relationship with somebody else. Then fast forward like five months into the relationship, actually neither of us had had any experience with anyone else. We were just enjoying each other honeymoon phase, you know, NRE. Yeah. <laughs> and then he actually ended up meeting up with someone who just moved to the city, moved to Berlin from France and who he'd met like years ago in an internship. And they just hung out as friends once. And then they ended up hanging up out again. And he, like, he kind of asked her on a date. So he was the first person to actually go out on a real date with somebody else, even though that was more of like a concern for him. Yeah. And that was like a, yeah, a really big experience for both of us. (laughs) Like that was really hard for me actually, um, in particular, uh, to, uh, yeah, to feel what it's like to not know what's going to happen next, especially because we would only been together six months and we were still in like this, like butterfly phase where things, we don't know where it's going to happen between us anyway, regardless of other people being in the picture. And, um, yeah, so that was really hard, but exciting, um, <laughs> as well. well but um, you hadn't really, you hadn't really yeah. established that security yet. Right. Like you yeah. were still figuring out what you two were and, yeah. and going from there. I want to, I want to come back to that date and how it was hard and like how you worked through that. But I, like you, you brought up non-monogamy initially, it sounds like in a previous yeah. relationship. And then in this one. Like where or how did you come to the like determination that you wanted to th- that you wanted to explore this that this might be something that you were interested in? Um, yeah, I was in several monogamous relationships, um, long term monogamous relationships throughout my twenties, and I it, it always came to an end at some point at, at around the year and a half mark. Uh, and there are always different reasons for that, but I think ultimately, like I value freedom a lot, and I value. Um, I also just love falling in love with people. Like that is like the most amazing feeling in the world, uh, in connecting with people. And I always felt a little bit like restricted by monogamy. Um, in my last monogamous relationship, when I was about twenty six, uh, about a year into our relationship, he got me this really nice necklace and I had this feeling like we were going, we were like on the path now, you know, we were together and this is it. And this is going to be the last person that I ever see. And I remember like this, like on our anniversary, getting me this necklace and 
it should be this moment where I should be so excited and happy. Oh, or like, you know, this, this means something. <laughs> and, um, and I just felt really like trapped. And I, I, I used that opportunity, which is hard. Like, I feel like I feel bad in hindsight used like saying this on this day, but I asked him, I was like, well, I don't know about being monogamous long-term. And he took that as a, um, me pulling away from him. And it means I don't, you know, he's like, no, but I want to be with you. And, and like, what, like, why, why are you thinking about this? Like, I love you and blah, blah, blah. And, and so then I kind of backtracked and I was like, oh no, um, no, I love you too. I want to be with you. And I, I did want to be with him, but I was also scared about what the implications of being together long-term were. And I didn't know anyone else who was non-monogamous, who, Mm -hmm was doing anything differently. So it was just like, I didn't know what the solution was. I just knew that I, there was just something not right about this. And I felt that a lot throughout my life, um, in my relationships. And yeah, so that was like a big fight and it lasted like we were, we were on a trip together at the time and we were okay. And we like, whatever, uh, we're civil. But then that even after the trip, we were kind of fighting. And then finally I convinced him, I love you. I want to be with you. And that's the most important thing. And I, I think I believe that in some way, like, I, I don't think I was being manipulative, but at the same time, I don't think I was, I think I was, um, intentionally hiding something so I could get what I wanted. Um, and that wasn't cool. (laughs) Uh, we ended up breaking up like two or three months later for, again, for other reasons technically, but I really do think that this was always a part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. Right. um, And then right after that is when I, like I was living in Brooklyn at the time and there I started getting like becoming more involved in like more alternative scenes. So like people who went to burning man, people who are like queer people who are into sex parties, people who are non-monogamous polyamorous. And that's when I was like, Oh wait, actually this is a thing people really do. And are there, really great people too. And they have normal jobs, normal lives. And, uh, there's something I can do as well. And that's when I started reading the books like sex at dawn, ethical slut to, uh, yeah. And started, and then I was like, this is for me. I'm going to, I'm going to try and do this. And so it was a little bit of like, just realizing that for myself and learning about it and telling anyone I met that this is, this is who I am now, or this is what I'm going to do now. Um, and just staying with it. And uh, now, five years later, <laughs> I'm in a happy relationship. It's not perfect, of course, but I'm in a happy, happy non-monogamous relationship, and it's like, yeah, I love it. It's such a, it's such a fun experience, and um, yeah, in so many ways. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the for <laughs> the background on it, yeah, and, I, and yeah. then and right, and then it sounds like you you brought it up to a, a partner, and it didn't go well like you tried it or you talked about it and it wasn't wasn't for him and this was someone the next person this is someone else after the one you said that you got in a big fight on vacation yeah yeah that that relationship ended and then the next relationship you brought it up again (laughs) yeah yeah well and i'm just curious so like when you brought it up and like you're thinking about this in terms of something you want to try had you thought about it from the perspective that like maybe the other person would be doing this as well. And it sounds like you guys kind of talked about with, with your current partner, like, Hey, we could do it like this and it would be sort of a safe container. And then they sort of took it to the next level. Almost like, I I just feel like maybe there was like this amount of like, it's easy sometimes to get excited about what you're going to experience. And then you forget about the fact that like, Oh, by the way, they're also doing this. And it's also a lot of emotions and it's intense and, you aren't expecting to be, you're like, I'm going to be the one to go out on the date. And then it's like, Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. they're on the date first. Like <sighs> I wasn't ready for this. Like, this is not why I brought this up, but like, <laughs> I was just curious, like your perspective on that. Cause it sounded like it caught you a little off guard and you had to work through some hard. And you're moving up to a current relationship. Exactly. Now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you skip, there's multiple relationships that we, we skip to current. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> oh, I thought it, I'm sorry. I missed no, that. No. I thought it, I thought it was, person who it didn't work out and then it was this person and it no, there, was is a, working out. there was a few years in between and and one one long-term relationship in between that actually 
Well, then um, let's talk about that. I'm <laughs> sorry. I totally, no, I totally okay. missed that. No, it's okay. I'm going to relate it to, to your question as well. Perfect. Actually. So it's going to be an answer to your question and I'm going to explain this, the other relationship as a, answering the question now. Perfect. Amazing. Wow. A, a, a gymnast <laughs> of answers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but then, then I was like, okay, so I, I was like a digital nomad at this point. I was, I learned programming and I was like just traveling the world, which is partially why I'd broken up with that monogamous person as well. Cause I was like, I want to travel for a year and yeah, it's not going to work out. And I met this guy, a German guy, not the German guy I'm currently seeing another German guy. Um, and he was the person that I went into this, like, well, like the first night we met before we had any idea we would start dating, I was telling him about non-monogamy and I was like, this is, this is why this makes sense. And he was like, yeah, actually I, I totally see why that makes sense. And he was, he was on board with it. I think, and I guess it's like when you're falling in love with someone, you, you, you see them as perfect and you, you, you kind of, you're, you're on board. You're like, Oh my God, I'm about, ev- I'm all about everything that you're about. And like, I think he was really excited. He's also like six years younger than I am. Um, so I think there was also this level of like, Oh wow. Like what you're doing is amazing. And so we started, we met in Mexico traveling. He was traveling by himself. I was traveling by myself. And then we decided after we met, we had like a sling. Okay. We actually want to be together. Um, and so basically I moved to Europe, like long story short, we traveled together for a while, but we both moved to Berlin together. And that was two and a half years ago, um, after dating for like a year. Um, and like from the beginning, we're like, all right, let's try this non-monogamy thing. But at first he was kind of like, I, and then we both ended up like kissing people while we were doing long distance, um, other people. And, but then he was like, let's, let's wait till we actually see each other again to really fully do non-monogamy. Um, because I want time to really get to like, get secure in our relationship. And then basically we were just like together all of the time because we were traveling together. So we just didn't have really much opportunity to meet other people. And that was fine. And we were in the beginning of the relationship and it, it was all good. And then we moved to Berlin together and there was like one or two, or there, like a couple of times basically when we were apart. And I really like took that opportunity when we were apart to like try and meet someone. It didn't always happen, but I like was like, Oh, we're not together now. Like now we can act on this, like, relationship dynamic that I really want to have. And like we agreed upon and, but every time, so I like kissed a guy here, kissed a guy there. Um, once, once out clubbing once was actually on a layover in Dublin when I was going to to Germany. (laughs) Um, and, but like each time this happened, it was only like three times, but, uh, it was just extremely hard on him. Um, he just didn't understand why I would want to do that. And he really took it as like a, like that he's not enough. And I think he was, yeah, like, I I don't, I don't think there was like in hindsight, anything that I could have, I think it was just the way it it was. And I thought that I just needed to be patient and that I needed to just like work with him and like, it would be fine. And, and, you know, we would figure it out and, um, he would, it would become easier on him was sort of like my mindset. Um, and it just, and it never did. Um, so that was like, we, we'd actually moved to Berlin together or living together when the last time this happened, like when I went out to this club, when he was away and kissed the last person I kissed while we were together. And then after that happened, we had another conversation and basically we were like, I agreed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it anymore because it was hurting him too much. And, um, yeah, I just cared about the relationship more. Um, we ended up breaking up like a few months later because we had another disagreement about when our timeline for having children. So he was six years younger. And that was also kind of like a pre, like before I went into the relationship with him and agreed to move to Europe and like be with him. I was like, these are the two things I really want in a relationship. (laughs) One was non-monogamy. And and the second was like, I want to start having kids like uh, in the next, like thinking about having children in the next like couple of years. This was when I was 29. Now I'm 33. Still don't have kids. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that was like sort of the, my, my like prerequisites almost. And 
so then he basically, at the same time that we stopped being non-monogamous, so like two months later, he was like, I don't know if I want to have kids soon. Like, I don't like now that I'm here I'm thinking about, it, I don't know if I want that anymore. He's like, but I really want to be with you. And yeah, so we, then he, then actually when, when we had the kids discussion, he was like, we were like, okay, then what are we going to do? Like, we have to break up then. And we're like, no, we we're like, we we're like sleeping on it, crying. How can we work this out? We love each other. We want to be together. And I was like, oh, we can be non-monogamous again. <laughs> I'll date people. I'll date people and like find someone maybe who wants to have kids with me and we can stay together. And that was, and he was like, okay, good. Like that's, he just wanted to be together. And that was like, felt like a solution that might work. We even went to like a polyamory meetup in Berlin together and it seemed like he was really dedicated to this and like, this was going to be potentially the solution, but I don't know if you guys can like predict that. that you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> <What's your opinion? laughs> I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking he, he wasn't, he wasn't real keen on you kissing people at the yeah. bar, yeah. but Hey, yeah, go ahead and have a kid with somebody else. Yeah. That yeah. seems like a, that seems like a pretty big leap, but I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't want to pass any judgment on that. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, that, that was basically essentially what you, you, you got it right. Like, no, it didn't, I basically went on a date or here and there and he was not, it was, he didn't take it well. It wasn't good on him. Um, uh, but actually one of those dates that I went on was my current partner, but you asked a question and I feel like I was going to answer that. Yeah. So with my current partner, when he went out on that date for the first time, I was actually, more happy that it worked out that way than the other way because I'd been through the other side already enough and that side sucks as mm -hmm. well <laughs> I think it sucks more I think feeling guilty that you're doing something wrong like I think I think maybe especially as a woman we have enough of that like both sides but and both men and women do but like we have the shame of if you're a sexual person and you want sex then you should feel bad about yourself and you're you should feel greedy and and I didn't want to feel like that anymore. So I was actually happy that the tables were turned when uh, my partner Flo took the first step and I wasn't that person anymore. So. Right. Cause then the work is on you, right? Then it's a, it's a sort of like, I need to work through this. Not like I'm putting somebody else through it. Yeah. 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 I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. And so in the interest of uh, trying to clarify things, so the, relationship yeah. <laughs> with the previous guy from Germany yeah. and it ended. And then yes. you shortly after that, or during that time, you met your current partner and you've been with your current partner. Did you say a year and a half? Yeah. 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 About and, a year and a half. Yeah. And so you've been starting to explore non-monogamy with him. And the first experience was him going out on a date with someone else. And that's what we're, I just mm -hmm. trying to like lay the groundwork because yeah, yeah, yeah. we've been kind of um, mm -hmm. talking about different relationships. Yeah. So that's where we're at now. The first date that you, that he went on with someone else when you were together. Right. And so how did, how did you work through that? And like, how, how has it progressed or how has it evolved since then? Um, I was just realizing that I'm like, nodding my head and I'm, I'm not saying yes. And this is only audio. So I should probably, it's okay. yes, but it's correct. It's okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So how, how it is, how has it been since this first date that he went on? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Like we got kind of got through. So that was an initial like shock. Okay. How, what's going to happen? Is it going to be okay? And it was okay <laughs> in the end. Uh, yeah, that was like six months into our relationship. And after they went on that date, what I really appreciated that Flo did and is that he said like, okay, we're not like, I'm not going to go out with her again right away. Like we're not going to go out again. And he, he like made sure that we had time to both like process it. And um, yeah, so like he didn't go out she, she actually asked him to, to go out again, like within like the week during like the next week. And, and he was like, no, like, let's take some time and go out later. And I don't think I would have asked him to do that, but I'm really glad he had decided to do that on his own because I really was of the like philosophy that 
like everyone should do what they want all the time. And I do not want to be the one to stand in someone's way of connecting with someone else and experiencing like the joy of being with another person in this way. Like, I don't want to be that person. And, but I also like am a human being and, uh, have insecurities and I needed to, it was hard for me to actually ask him to, it would have been really hard for me to ask that because I felt, I feel, I don't want to be, it's, it makes me vulnerable. It makes me, I don't know, feel like someone I don't want to be, but like, I've never been in this situation. I'd never been in this situation before. And, um, I'm really glad I had that time to like really process it. And right after their date, we also, there was some family, like, uh, there was some family stuff that, uh, he had to deal with. So we actually were away from Berlin for a while right after that. And then she was away for a while. So their relationship was very like slow. They, they actually went on several dates, but it was over the course of like six months or something. Um, so they never started really dating or like getting into a real, like a relationship. And I really wanted to, I hadn't had a, like, I hadn't slept with anyone else for a long time, especially at the beginning. And I, that was something that bothered me a little bit. Like I, I was like, if he was away or like, I was not with him, I would also be like, Oh, this is my opportunity to like, try to to like hook up with someone else. And I did kiss a guy here or there. Like I, and I went, ended up going on a date with one, a few days with one, one man who is really, really nice. And we, we saw our friends. Um, but I didn't have like this, Oh, I met someone I like. I like them and we're sleeping together. We're hanging out and we're enjoying that. Like I didn't have that. And so I was jealous. I was envious of that. Mm -hmm. Um, what he had with, with her. Mm -hmm. Um, now, however, like this summer I did meet someone who I did have this connection with. And we went on a few dates before both of us left, uh, for New York where we've been for the last two months. So we're away now for like a four month period. Mm -hmm. And so all that's on pause, but neither of us have been dating anyone really like more, more seriously yet. That makes sense. When you had those feelings of jealousy and envy come up for you, how did you work through those? How did you navigate those? Because that's super common. Yeah. Um, so the first time it happened, uh, what did I do? But I, well, I always, I write, <laughs> I write a lot, of, a lot about my, my feelings, like, especially when something new comes up, writing helps me just be like, okay, what's going on here? What, you know, how do I feel? You know, I know it's just, just describing the feelings and that really, really helps. And then also, um, so, and then just waiting, like over time through just spending more time with Flo, like after that first date. Um, it just made me realize, all right, he's still here for me in reality. There's nothing actually to be afraid of or to be sad about. And I also kind of enjoyed it too, because I felt like at that point, our honeymoon period was starting to like fizzle out a little bit, but that really brought back this uncertainty, which also comes with feel like excitement, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And that, and I was just like, okay, like what's happening. I feel scared, but like, also this is kind of exciting. And I was just, I enjoyed it as well, to be honest. Um, (laughs) and then later on, yeah, like, and then later on, like, so a few months later when I felt more secure in our relationship flow and I, my relationship and he, but he went out on a date with, um, Kat, Kat, Catherine, that's what her pseudonym <laughs> on, on my, on my blog. Uh, they went to like some lake together one day on a date. And I remember he him coming back and telling me about it and being super, I just wanted him to say like, Oh yeah, it wasn't that fun or something like that. <laughs> but he was just kept on going and it seemed like, so he's like, and then we watched the sunset over the lake. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you're like, no, I don't want to hear about it anymore. I <laughs> uh, couldn't eat it anymore. <laughs> and, uh, but then, um, no. And then, yeah, also then we just decided, okay, I-, I told him I was feeling this way. But also recognizing at the same time, I feel this way and I know that it's immature. And I know that, like, 
or not immature necessarily, but I know that it's your, I'm happy it's your, for you. Yeah. Right? It's your, it's your feelings. Yeah, it's your feelings. responsibility to manage them. Yeah. 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 And, and it's not, he didn't do this to you. You are, yeah. you're feeling these, these things are things you agreed on and you're working through them and you want to work through them together. Right. Yeah. 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 Essentially. Um, yeah. And then we were like, we need to go uh, to do something fun that we not just sit in and cook together and watch movies, which is what I think we had begun to do more of, mm-hmm. like, more of so it was just a reminder that we have to we should do something fun we should plan something fun together and we did and uh in some ways maybe that helped us become more uh yeah like happier or or, yeah have a have a more exciting Mm -hmm. uh relationship and it's like this what uh, i was i was interviewing someone for like this online summit uh that i doing that i did in january Mm -hmm. and uh, she was saying that you can, you can redistribute NRE. So just because like he is feeling this like new relationship feelings and energy with somebody else doesn't mean that he can't use that to boost your relationship too. Um, and so I think that sort of, yeah, you can, even though something's not happening to you, it can be, Mm -hmm. um, helpful to the, everyone involved romantically with each other, the, the, the polycule, if it's that or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy in our relationships, we'll say our primary relationships, like, or any long-term relationship to get complacent, to be like, oh, well, like all we have to do is like cook dinner and maybe watch a movie and sit on the couch and then we go to bed and then we get up and we do it again the next day. And then somebody new comes in you're like, we're going to go to the movies and we're going to go bowling and we're going to go whatever, play laser tag or paintball, like all these exciting things. And you're like, well, Hey, we haven't done anything like that in like a year. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's so easy to like get complacent with that. So I, I yeah. can do that. Yeah. yeah. How about when, when you started going down that, when you met somebody and I don't necessarily want you to like speak for him, but like, how did it go? Like, he was kind of on this path and you were working through a lot of this. And then all of a sudden you're on the path and mm-hmm. now he's kind of in that same position you were in, you know, six months or a year before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It wasn't easy for him either. I mean, I think, um, yeah, he's more, both of us are more worried about the emotional bond becoming stronger. And, you know, one thing, so I also tried to give him that same, what he did for me, which is not jumping in. So not letting the feelings of excitement in the beginning, like with someone new and not knowing, like not getting too caught up in that so that you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're that, so that I was ignoring or not paying attention to the person that I love and that I have a committed relationship to his needs and uh, feelings. So that was, yeah, that was really important. I guess more, yeah, I'm trying to think more specifically what I could say say about this. And, and you don't necessarily need to. I just was curious, like, if it, how did it go roughly, like, similar? Or, like, it sounds like he kind of had some, some of the same feelings come up and you handled them roughly the same way he did. And, like, you two kind of worked on that together. And it sounds like, and you said earlier, like, hey, we're in a happy not perfect, but a happy non-monogamous relationship at this point. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, yeah, it's just like holding space for each other's feelings. That's pretty Mm much, um, you know, like more specifically, like we've also agreed, like after someone has a date, the other person is responsible. Sorry. The person who's been on the date is responsible for reaching out to us or to me or him, depending who's on the equation. Um, and saying, all right, when, when are you free? And like planning something after that so that we have it, like, we know that if we're on the side of knowing our partners on a date, (laughs) he'll, he'll reach out to me and we'll plan something together where we can talk about it and feel like that love, like loved and secure again. And that, that's been really important. That's helped me a lot to know that we'll see each other again. And he started dating another woman too around the same time that it went from the summer, we both actually met different people at different festivals <laughs> over the summer. So that was when I met the first person that I really like, had a connection with. And then he met another woman um, who's, who's actually really, uh, she's, she's polyamorous and 
has a lot of experience with it, which I, I felt could be uh, cool for both of us because, you know, she probably has a lot she can share with him and um, knowledge and stuff like that, but also kind of intimidating at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's ex- exactly. And I think we, we've had some similar conversations lately of like, there's a, there's a double-edged sword there. There's the, Hey, this is intimidating. The person you met is polyamorous and they, so they like this possibility is very real that it becomes more, but at the same time they're polyamorous. So they understand that like their goal isn't to like drive you apart from your current partner to like make you theirs. Like, so it's scary, but it's also like good at the same time. And it's a really, it's a really weird clash. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, the, it's funny because actually the first woman he, he met is like monogamous and has said that she does, she doesn't want anything. Like she wants to be monogamous with someone. So that's kind of threatening, Mm -hmm. but at the same time she under she, she understood it. Like we met and she was like, it was, it was fine. It was fine. And she's a good person. And, and then this new, newer person is polyamorous. And I told, and like, so I feel like more comfortable, but at the same time, I think it's like this, for me, the jealousy often comes from the comparing myself to another person. So I think in this case, it feels more like, Oh, well, she has all this knowledge. She's also older and, um, you know, maybe she can bring more to the table than I can, but it still wasn't as bad as that first time. It wasn't as a uh, strong negative emotion as, as that first time yeah. where I didn't feel as secure in my relationship with Flo. Cause that yeah. I feel like is a real, that's the real, um, now I feel very secure in this, in our relationship. So that's made it a lot easier. I mean, it's, it's still, some feelings are coming up of jealousy, but it's not, it's not even close to that first, first time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I just want to clarify too, your, your, the strategy you two have come up with is if you go on a date with somebody else, it's the onus is on you to reach out to Flo and say, Hey, I want to go do some fun activity. And if Flo goes on a date with somebody else, he reaches out to you and says, Hey, Sarah, I want to go and do a fun activity with you. You kind yeah. of said like, that's how the, the responsibility gets assigned at, at that time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we also check with each other before we go on a date. Again, all this is like subject to change as we go on. We're still, sure. it's, it really like we haven't been together for a while, but we still, I mean, I'm sure it has to do with COVID as well. But we, yeah. we really, really haven't explored so much. Um, yeah. And there's so much more to explore. Um, but, yeah, it's like we check with each other before we go on a date we, that we make a date with someone else. Um, and, of course, we're also at the same time trying to make every like make sure we're being sensitive to the people we're dating. I didn't mention that yet, and I just wanted to yeah, yeah say that as well before uh, continuing with. I mean, mm-hmm. we're the only people that are in a committed relationship, so, of course, that's like – um, more of what's going on is just between us, but yeah, we're also talking about, well, how can we be empathetic to everyone and, um, taking into account other people too and what they need and stuff. But well, I think that's a super important thing to bring up. Like you two, and this comes up frequently as like, you kind of have this couple privilege where you're like, we're the unit. And so anybody who's outside of our unit is sort of like ancillary and, it is important, like you said, to like make sure they're feeling cared for and loved and respected. And that like, yeah, like it's, it almost, I was actually think, thinking about this, like it works in reverse. Like if you and Flo are like, we do all this super exciting stuff. And then every time you hang out with your other partner, like you don't do anything like that can feel kind of shitty in reverse as well. So like, I was like, how, how do you and Flo like manage that sort of, I don't know if power imbalance is the right word, but that sort of imbalance. Yeah. You mean, uh, make sure that, so like the imbalance that we, we have the couple's privilege that that's yeah. that being the power, power imbalance. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's mostly just like, there's no specific rule in mm-hmm. place there. I think we're, we're both empathetic people and like, we want to be good people and that's like a uh, important for both of us, not be assholes. And so we're just, we just try to be sensitive to that. And, um, there hasn't been any specific situation that has come up that it's like, we had to make a decision that was difficult. And it comes to that, there there was nothing that like, 
oh, we're on a date and I called him to come home or something, you know, there was no, nothing like that. Like if he's on a date with someone, he's on a date with them. And unless something is really important, like we won't even text while they're Mm -hmm. together, um, until, um, the next morning until we know the dates, (laughs) like we wait for the other person to text that they're done with the date. You know, when, when, when we're with on a date with someone like that, our time and our energy is focused on that person during that time. Yep. And, um, also like, so Flo and I don't live together. So I think that helps to like separate. So like when I'm with Flo, we're together, our energy is there. And when we're apart, that's when we can put our energy wherever we want. And then when we're right. with a, on a date where our energy is there. So, um, yeah, I think it works out pretty easily so far with that. Yeah. And that's concerned. And we just are very honest with the yeah. people yeah. we're with. So we would never tell, not tell someone that we're, together or something like that or but yeah just being really honest about that and uh, not keeping anything in order to get some other to get something we want not keeping anything from anyone yeah 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 Yeah, no that makes sense uh you had made the comment that there's so much more to explore and (laughs) and how I'm, i'm curious how what you see in the future for your relationship and that's an impossible question i know but kind of what, what's your vision? Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of have the idealistic image of being in like a commune, a polyamorous commune and having children with like, uh, like two different men and then like them having children with a bunch of, with a few different people and like all our kids play together in the yard. And, um, that's like my, my fantasy a little bit. Like I, I, I don't know if that's true. Like, I don't know if in practice I would actually want that, but I, I like that idea of having like a mixed family. Uh, maybe, yeah. And there's some, like queer people, gay people as well involved and not just a, mm-hmm. yeah. And for him, I think it's more, he does see more of a, more of a traditional relationship, like monogamish type relationship. That was, that was his vision at the beginning. I mean, that's already changed and I am not, tied to any specific thing either. I just like that we are able to talk about it. I like the way it is now and that we have the freedom to discuss whatever we desire that comes up and really have like that honest conversation. And we're also like also in the future, I guess we have in mind is, is to see a therapist. That's something we haven't done yet, but um, yeah, it is hard to have these conversations sometimes and balance like, okay, one of our needs need for freedom with the others need for security. I think that's, this is a conversation that we're we're continually having is okay. Maybe like, I want this, but this makes me feel this way. Um, you know, how do we, what's the solution here? And, and also like paying attention to the fact that, um, that security in the moment is actually can be more important because, that's so like when, if, if like, for example, just to put it more concrete, like if he goes out on a date or he is sending someone a text or wants to, I don't know, wants to go on a date with X, Y, or Z, and I'm feeling threatened by that, that might actually be a stronger emotion in the moment than his need for freedom in that moment, his need to go explore. So that's something I'm trying to be sensitive to lately as well, is that this, um, this need for security is actually can come from like a primal need to for safety. And that's actually in the moment really important and can without, if it's not addressed can lead to like a panic or primal panic. Um, So that's something I'm learning. And well, and if you're in, and maybe what I was hearing in there was that like your need for that security trumps maybe comes across stronger than his need to go out. And so it's easier for him to be like, okay, then I won't go out and to sort of like cave to what your, your stronger need than what he's expressing is. Did I, did I catch that? Right. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. I don't want to say that one person's need is more important than the other. I I think, but I think, (laughs) yeah, I think that, um, I, I, yeah, I guess the main takeaway is that 
when someone is feeling unsafe in the relationship, that's probably more important in the moment than someone's need to explore Mm -hmm. in the moment. Long-term, I think the person's need to explore is going to like, if that keeps on getting shut down, if that keeps on getting, if that person is continuously holding themselves back from doing something they want to do, that's going to wear and tear on the relationship and probably not, you know, that's going to end up exploding. But in the moment, if someone is feeling, one person is feeling unsafe and like really is feeling unsafe and it's not all the time. And this is like really um, a moment for them. It's probably a more a reason to, to pause and talk and figure that out before someone explores something else. Yeah. That's what I, I think. And this is based on yep. like reading about this stuff and psychology and, and all of this as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and also like what I've experienced personally. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. For sure. Yeah. How have you seen yourself grow over the last five years? That's a big question, but yeah. in exploring non-monogamy, how have you seen yourself grow? Yeah, I think one big thing with... Not sure if it's, I mean, this has been through exploring non-monogamy, but just in general, what I've been realizing is that although this is something, this is definitely a relationship style that I want to be in and that I feel is right for me, I think that to be in a long-term relationship, it's not about what style of a relationship it is. Uh, It's about really wanting to be in that relationship and Mm -hmm. um, being committed to that. And of course, taking care of yourself too. And that's the most important thing. I think the individual is more important than the relationship, but to, to really um, be committed to the relationship is the most important thing to be in a long-term relationship, regardless of the style. And you can always push for something different. You can always push for, okay, I want to be in the polyamorous commune. Okay, I want to. <laughs> I want to go to sex parties. I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, but you're going to have to like, if you want to be in a long term relationship, that takes collaboration, um, and it takes, uh, yeah, a willingness to put yourself into someone else's shoes and 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 not always get what you want when you want it all the time. And that's something that I've definitely learned over the last years. And uh, yeah, it doesn't. I would, yeah, it doesn't matter what the, yeah, what exactly it is you do, just that commitment. Yeah, totally. And I, I love that approach. And like the, 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 the fact, like you said, like that the individual is almost more important than the relationship because you can't, you can't show up for the relationship unless you're in a good, like a good place, right? Like mm-hmm. if you can try and you can, I mean, it's not that you don't want to, but like, you you have yeah like you have to be feeling well because the relationship the relationship suffers if you're not in a personally in a good place Mm -hmm. if either one of you is not in a good place then the relationship suffers yeah absolutely yeah how like and and we we have not i'm trying to think we've had one german person on the show um but that I can rec- I think one german person who's we've had a couple not very many (laughs) and i was just curious like the like sort of the culture around non-monogamy in Germany and also like tying that into like our, how, like how open are you? How, how do you navigate like this dynamic, like on a day-to-day basis, like with family and friends and just in the culture there, like we're fairly familiar with the U S and obviously it wi- ranges widely from like San Francisco to the middle of the woods in Kentucky, like very different places, <laughs> but like, just like generally what your experience has been. Just imagine like Berlin's probably different from the rest of Germany too. Uh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, Berlin. <laughs> Having been to Berlin during pride weekend one time. Yeah. Oh, it's nice. an insane, it's an insane place. And I can imagine it's not like everywhere else in Berlin or in Germany, but yeah, that was a big question. It was, it was a lot yeah, of, a lot no. of talking. I'm sorry. Really good for that. question. No, it's great. Um, Berlin, I feel like is actually similar. I haven't spent a lot of time to San Francisco, San Francisco. I haven't spent a lot of time in San Francisco Bay area, but I've been there and it's super open. And it felt like when I was there that every other person was non-monogamous and it was almost more likely than not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that in Berlin a little bit, like 
you're either, if you're not non-monogamous, you're like gender non-conforming or you're this or that. Yeah. Like there's just so many different things you could be that are non-traditional essentially Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your relationship style or your sexuality. And so that's great. I think that's awesome. It's super open-minded and I never would feel uncomfortable saying that like who I am or talking about it in, in Berlin. At the same time, I think there's like a, a flip side to that, which I saw in San Francisco a little bit. And I've saw, I've seen in Berlin where people go around saying that they're polyamorous and they don't really know what it is or know anything about it. They're just like, I'm single <laughs> or I, I want to <laughs> sleep around or I want to have casual relationships and not com- commit to anyone. So I'm, I must be polyamorous. Um, whereas I felt like in, in Brooklyn, even though it's also extremely open-minded liberal place, because it is within the greater New York city, which is yes, very liberal, but also quite conservative in a lot of ways when you compare it to some of these other places. And it's very like, uh, right. Um, capitalist, capitalistic Mm -hmm. and, and traditional in a lot of ways as well. So I felt like in Brooklyn, people would uh, become or like have found their way into these pockets and to these culture, into this subculture. Whereas I felt, I felt like in San Francisco, that was the main culture in Berlin. It's kind of the same way, this like open-minded kind of anti-establishment, non-traditional lifestyle. And so I think people end up going into it without giving it a lot of thought necessarily. But at the same time, that's, it's also great because you could, you, you would never feel, um, weird or um isolated by being different so yeah. and there are two sides to that so in berlin definitely not a problem and it's like i we use i i, I use have used fields there the app mm-hmm. there's a ton of people on fields with and there's just like a ton of weirdos in all different directions <laughs> any kind of weirdo that you will, will find you'll find in berlin and then in terms of like my family and coming like talking about that was your uh, second question or part of the question, I think. Is that right? It was one of it was one of the ten <laughs> questions I asked in my, in my monologue. How, how open are you with with family and friends? <laughs> yeah, um, I so I'm op- very open online, and that was like that was kind of hard at first because yeah, it took me a long time to op- to start talking about this, partially because of my last relationship. Like we didn't even we even had trouble talking about it, like because it would be triggering for him. Like I didn't even, I didn't feel like it was something I could, I could talk about freely and feel confident in it, in it until I feel like it's only been the last year and a half, maybe, or two years of the last five years that I've ex- been exploring this, that I feel really comfortable to pretty much anyone just saying, saying it and talking about it. Yeah. Like my, in terms of like my immediate family, I've had some, some pushback from my, like my, my brother who he's, he comes from like his friends are a little bit more conservative and like, they've actually poked fun at, at him for talking about, for me talking about sexuality uh, publicly, which is really like, yeah, kind of shitty. Um, and then yeah. like, he's given me some pushback for that. And I kind of tried to come out to my mom about it, but she doesn't really, she's a, yeah. she comes from uh, Haiti originally. And I think, I think she spent a lot of her time trying to like fit in with being American and, and she does a great job of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think she's, as a lot of older people are specifically not, she doesn't understand. Like when you have no, no context for it, whatever, yep. you don't know one who, who does it. And um, she just wants the best for me. She wants me to be in a relationship and have chill, have grandchildren like most moms do. And um, so I tried to kind of tell her about it just so we could have an open dialogue, but it, it didn't go well. Um, and basically she just doesn't want to know about it. Um, right. And that's cool. I'm, I'm okay with that. If it, when she's ready to talk about it or when it really comes up and becomes more of something that we need to talk about for whatever reason, then we'll have that conversation, um, again, but it's okay with me for, you know, as long as I don't feel like I'm hiding something myself, 
um, then I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm, I feel, feel good. Yeah. 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 Well, I appreciate it. And it is like, like you said, it's, it, I mean, I imagine that there's a part of you that's a little disappointed, like, Oh, I would like to talk to her about it, but also like, okay, like we don't have to, Yeah. like when you're, when she's ready, then I'm here. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You're not necessarily hiding it, but you don't need to like be yeah. throw it in her face either. Yeah. 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 I think there's some sort of, I think always with parents, there's this need for validation and yeah. you want them to accept every, everything, <laughs> every little thing that you do. Yeah. Um, no, no, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know what that's like, but I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. think with this though, it's easier to, ooh, it's easier to forgive with this. It's easier to forgive because I know what it's like to not have any idea about this world. And mm-hmm. so yeah. I can't, ex- I can't take that personally that she doesn't have any context for it to accept right. it. So. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 That's beautifully said. Um, how about your health and safety in navigating navigating non monogamy? How do you keep yourself sexually and physically safe in those experiences as you navigate that? Yeah. I mean, with with uh, STD prevention, with respect to that, we're always we always use uh, condoms with with each other. We don't, but with other people, we do. Mm-hmm. And yeah, with, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly with consent for me, it feels like we are, yeah, we always make sure we give consent. I'm not sure where, where, what I can add to that, but. Well, but if you, you find your, yourself, finding yourself in situations that perhaps are uncomfortable or, or maybe you haven't and like, how have you kept yourself maybe out of those situations. Like if you've gone on 50 dates and you've never wound up in a situation where you like felt pressured or uncomfortable, like there's, there's obviously something you're doing to control for that. Like, unless you're just super lucky, which if that's the case, like, okay. But like chances are like, maybe you're doing something, even if it's subconsciously to like vet and screen and make sure you're putting yourself into like good, safe situations. But Mm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess this wouldn't, be different from you know being non-monogamous or or not um mm-hmm. but i don't know yeah I, I tend to want to get to know people before i end up like in a that's actually not <laughs> true now that i think about it no i mean i i think i've i it's hard to to really be 100 percent safe of course like when i was traveling i went home with people that I just met, uh, here and there. And you can never really know if they're going to be good people, but I guess, I guess just, yeah. I mean, you gotta, follow your like, gut. you don't have to, yeah, follow your gut. I and mean, that's what I've been doing. It's, it's, it's worked out for the most part for me, <laughs> thankfully. But, um, yeah, I guess if you, if like, yeah, if I really want to be safe is make sure that you know, I get to know the person at least somewhat always have tell someone where you're going. I think that's mm-hmm. like good. And you know, that's important. I can go a long way if something were yeah. to happen. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. And maybe tying it back to like your travel. Cause like, we, we've both backpacked in South America yeah. for like a year. And like, as you're, as you're doing that and you're in hostels and you're in all these different situations, like you're, you're constantly judging character, right? Like you might be sleeping in a room with 10 other people and like, yeah you could be put in a situation whether or not you're trying to like where something could happen, right? Like you go to sleep and you don't know there's, there's 10 other people in this room that maybe you've never met, maybe you've never even talked to. Mm -hmm. So like maybe, I mean, there might be something there just like, and me thinking through this, like the ability to judge character that you pick up in like traveling and uncomfortable situations where you don't know the language, you don't, you don't know anything other than like the feeling you get when you're around somebody. And I think there really is something like to that. And obviously you can always be surprised, but like, I don't know. I think that's a sort of an acquired skill Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's hard to say. Like I, I I would like to think that like (laughs) I'm able to judge someone is a good person or or what their intentions are. And I'm sure I'm able to do that pretty well. But the people who end up finding, yeah, the people who end up finding themselves in situations where 
the person, you know, whatever, wasn't a good person, uh, and something went wrong. I'm assuming they also felt that way. Sure. Yeah. They were like, <laughs> this could end poorly. Let's go for it anyway. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. No yeah. one choose it. Like you don't choose to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I get that. It's tricky. Yeah. yeah. And maybe it's one of those things that you, it's sort of innate and you, you sort of hone it over, over time being mm. in those situations. So mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I would add one thing to that actually, now that you're making me think more about it is, you know, I've been in a situation like traveling in India. I can tell a story, quick story. Like I, I was on, under the influence of LSD and I'd taken like some MDMA earlier in the evening and I ended up taking too much LSD afterwards and just like couldn't couldn't move I was like at the edge of the dance floor I was there with someone I really trusted a lot he was like my really close friend and I really had this feeling in my head like this idea in my head that nothing bad could happen to me and that I was safe and we were in like a small group like it was a it was a club but it was like a kind of a private party mm-hmm. and um I was on the edge of the dance floor kind of passed out and just listening to the music and really enjoying it And my friend was coming over to me every now and then and asked me if I was okay. And I was just like, yeah, like, of course I'm okay in my head. And I didn't find out till like hours later that there was this guy who I'd met very briefly earlier in the night and was nice to because I was like at this place with friends of friends. And he had been like basically groping me like the entire time. And I didn't real, I didn't know this. And my friend was asking me if I was okay, but wasn't telling, like no one told me what was happening. (laughs) And thankfully, like uh, he he was trying to get me to come home with him at some point, but thankfully like I snapped out of it and then ended up like getting like my friend and I left together. But that was a really eye opening experience because I think it's important that when we go out together, first of all, especially if you're going to be whatever it is, consuming alcohol, doing drugs, whatever it is, is to say, okay, like, yeah, just tell that story to them. <laughs> so, like, even if I say I'm okay, make sure you know what's like, I know what's going on. Um, yeah. and, um, yeah, there's so many things like that, 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 that could happen. So it's like, even if you're with someone you trust and it's always, it's often going to be a friend of a friend or an acquaintance. That's, that's the perpetrator when there's sexual assault. Right. So, um, uh, just help each other out and like be there for each other. Tell your friend, like, make sure your friends know what's going on. And, um, that that they're okay yeah mm-hmm. i think that's super uh, great advice yeah whether it's uh, alcohol like any any substance that you could that's sort of going to alter your cognizant ability like is super important so yeah, yeah mm-hmm. appreciate that and and appreciate the vulnerability in sharing that story like that's a <laughs> that's a really hard like thing to go through and like find Situation. out later that like that was happening like so yeah I'm sorry that yeah. happened yeah. thank you yeah Um, I know that we could talk all night, (laughs) but before I, do you have any other questions? I wanted to make sure before we wrap up, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about any other topics that you wanted to share, get out there? And then we'd love for you to talk a little bit about your work as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I think one big thing that I've been talking about a lot. And when I talk about non-monogamy, I approach it from the angle of, uh, sex positivity, uh, because I, th- I think that's like a huge precursor to be able to be a non-monogamous. You really have to believe that sexuality is good and sex is good. And I think, I think a lot of people in non and polyamorous circles sometimes skip over that part because there's so much more to talk about, uh, than that. And, and it comes sometimes comes, I think as obvious, like, Oh yeah, we all believe that sex is good, but, um, yeah, a lot of people don't really get that. And I think all of us have that, especially if you're, I think the newer generation, not as much Gen Z is getting, is better at believing sex is good and talking about sexuality and um, exploring sex, learning ways to explore sex more positively in positive ways. But my generation, millennials um, and older grew up with a lot of shame when it comes to sex and experience masturbation and whatever, whatever that is. And, and so focus on that first before you focus on non-monogamy because you'll never be okay with yourself, like 
kissing other people, having sex with more than one person, if you don't believe that sex is good <laughs> and beautiful and um, can be a way of like opening yourself up and becoming a more, um, yeah, a, exploring yourself and growing and ha- become a happier person. So that's what I would leave people with. Yeah. And I um, yeah, I do. I, I'm, I took, I, I'm teaching a course now uh, about how to have the sex life that you desire. And so if anyone wants more information about that, I will I'll definitely put that in, send that to you guys. And, yeah, um, <laughs> it'll be in the, it will be in the show notes for anybody who's interested. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there any other work that you're doing that you want to put out there? Yeah. My blog, I, I'm always writing. I write about one post a week about, um, usually about sexuality, sometimes non-monogamy and once in a while about random other stuff. And, uh, right. I also am, have an Instagram account that's quite active. So if anyone wants to follow me there, they can also find out more of the stuff that I'm doing um, to further the the general movement towards a more sexually free, open place so that we can all stop clenching up and hiding whatever we want and um, love and connect more freely. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that work that you're doing and all the writing and links to everything will be in the show notes. Yeah. Just, I want to say a huge thank you for, yeah, for all that work and for coming on and being vulnerable with us and sharing your story. Like it's, it's powerful and we thank you. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the space and all these other wonderful speakers. Um, of, yeah, I really appreciate it. Of, <laughs> of course. course. Of course. Well, have a fantastic evening. And we will uh, be in touch and we look forward to like an update. An update, yeah. (laughs) Great. Yeah, in the future. Thank you. And we're back. A huge thank you to Sarah for reaching out to us, coming on the show, and for all of the amazing work you're doing with your writing and the summit coming up. So this is also a quick reminder, go sign up for the Alternative Relationship Summit next week, January 13th to the 14th. All the links are in the show notes. And remember, if you miss it, you're listening to this in the future, you can still go sign up and access all of the content using the links that Emma just told you about in the show notes. Yes. Well, you're on our website. A quick reminder to go check out our community events tab. You can find information about all of our upcoming virtual and in-person events there. And on the Patreon tab, all the information about joining the Patreon community. We'd love to have you at any and all of these events. So go check it out and also reach out to us uh, with any questions as well. And the last thing you can do while you're on our website is look at the resources tab. This is where Emma and I have all of our favorite resources that we use in our explorations of non-monogamy. Yes. One of our favorites of the favorites. We call this the most favorite. <laughs> the favoritist. The favoritist. <laughs> STDcheck.com. It's how Emma and I get tested for STIs. It's how we've gotten tested for years. Mm-hmm. We love it. It's super easy. It's fast. It's affordable. It's discreet. And uh, yeah, we just love it. So we promote it as much as we possibly can because sexual health and safety are of the utmost importance Mm -hmm. using the links on the website does support the show financially you also save ten dollars so everybody wins we thank you in advance for that and we've got some really exciting stuff coming up next week but not next week this week i I misspoke and then corrected myself i tried to use like the little whiteout pen okay but you didn't right okay you could have just gone back and edited this but i'm not going to (laughs) okay well this friday and that's in two days we have a special bonus episode um it's actually a three-part series this friday and then the next two fridays after this it's going to be uh just a bonus part of our focus fridays series and this one's going to be on the end Enneagram. The Enneagram is a personality and motivation assessment, and we, Finn and I, go through this whole process with an Enneagram coach named Kelsia, and she works with Catherine from Expansive Connection, which you may have heard about previously on our show as well. We'll go into all the details when it comes out on Friday, so you'll find out more then, but we wanted to mention it now, and we're super excited to get this out there. Perhaps you don't want to wait till Friday. Nope. Well, you don't have to. That's right. If you join our Patreon, you get access to all three episodes immediately starting right now in this moment. You sign up and you get access to all three episodes. You don't have to wait. 
right? So go check it out. We're super excited again about these episodes. We also have our regular scheduled programming next Wednesday. We have an interview with Whitney. So you can also come back and listen then. You should come back and listen. Yes, Because it's another amazing conversation that we're excited to get out there. Yes. Thanks for sticking with us with those long intro and outro. We appreciate it. And for, of course, the interview with Sarah. Um, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy 2022. And... That's it, right? That's all we got. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.